Warwick Combs. He's the man. His whole life spent on working on engineering at the highest level. There is no higher level than space because the, uh, it's in a hostile environment where the temperature changes are enormous as vacuum and there's radiation. Carl's actually pretty impressed. I think, I think so, yes. <laughs> Just tell us your role. That well, mission. I'm what they call an avionics systems engineer, and that's somebody who's involved in the testing of the electrical systems, the hardware and the software. Uh, the problem with the Rosetta spacecraft was because it was going so far away from the Earth, out to the orbit of Jupiter, in fact, I mean, it had to look after itself. It had to have an enormous amount of inbuilt intelligence because this, uh, the signals travelling at the speed of light at the maximum distance took 50 minutes one way. So it's far too long to react if something was going wrong. Any little glitch can mean absolute disaster. Well, th well thousands of hours of testing of the software on the ground, thinking of every nightmare scenario. Your smartphone you're lucky to get two years out of, and here you are ten years in a truly hostile environment, and then after ten years you wanted to wake up and say, hi, I'm ready to rock, give me instructions. Uh it's amazing when the distance that travelled, it had to go so fast and then you had to br it had to break to slow down and actually land uh, on the comet. Just talk us through the difficulty of that and also the mission itself it came very close to disaster, didn't it? Well, we, we had to gain an extra 50,000 kilometres an hour of speed and all the fuel on board the spacecraft could only give us 8,800 kilometres an hour. So we had to use what we call gravity assist. We had to synchronise with the planets in the solar system to give us extra speed. It took 10 years of travel, 7 billion kilometres, just to get to the comet. And that was the beginning of the mission. So 10 years to begin the mission. Okay. Uh, the big problem that we had was, um, was the landing. So the spacecraft is, Rosetta is successfully in orbit and has been, will be for two years, in fact. But so the, it's in orbit around the comet? Rosetta, the mother spacecraft, is in orbit around the space. Held there the by comet. the weak gravity of the comet so and in a parallel orbit as it goes with the comet Jupiter, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, we're, Earth, Mars. We're, we're currently at, at, at only 10 kilometres above the surface wow. of the comet, so we're doing very, very slow, very, very close orbits with Rosetta, the three-ton mother spacecraft. But the little fillet, which is about 100 kilograms, about the size of a, of a bar fridge, mm. is down on the surface, and that did science successfully for three days. But it bounced when we landed, and we, we weren't planning a bounce. Uh, the two harpoons, which were meant to fire and hold onto the surface, didn't fire because the, the radiation from space had changed the chemistry of the, of the firing mechanisms. Wow. So um, that was unexpected, but it bounced 1.3 kilometres. It took one hour and 50 minutes to come back down again because we, uh, the gravity on the comet is only 100 thousandth of a G. It's a very small comet, 4 by 3 by 2 kilometres, and the, the little lander bounced very slowly, and it took, we were all watching this for <laughs> one and a half hours, <laughs> and then it came back down again. Unfortunately, it landed in a crevice, and that meant it was obscured by, uh, we wanted to get sunlight on the comet. The aim of the mission, what's it going to tell us about life here on Earth? Well, what is so different about a comet than any other planetary body in our solar system is that it hasn't been affected by heat. So all our planets, and the sun itself, of course, has, has been massively changed by heat. Comet material is f more than 4.6 billion years old, and it was before the sun or the planets existed. And the chemistry in a comet is completely different than anything we've ever seen. And so it tells us about the, the very primordial carbon chemistry that we believe was brought to the Earth to help create the oceans and to start life very quickly. So there's some very important carbon chemistry that we've found on the comet, which explains the formation of, of, uh, of um, the uh, amino acids in our bodies. Carl, you can put this into context. How exciting is that? Well, that's one side of it. Actually, seeing the raw carbon chemistry. And the other thing that's in my background is that every now and then we just get missed by a lump of rock that could wipe us out, like previously one wiped out the dinosaurs. And this technology of being able to go out there and then maybe nudge it, just push it if you've got 10 years warning, just to fire up some iron engines. This is the technology that could save the human race for the downline. You, like me, when we were kids, I was absolutely fascinated with space. For me, that, uh, that was merely a dream and I, I soon moved on. But for you, you were totally obsessed with it to the point where you actually ended up working uh, with, a, with a space mission. Uh, just tell us how, how that came about. Well, as an eight-year-old, I watched Neil Armstrong bouncing down the ladder on walking on the moon. I was in Adelaide in grade two. And I just couldn't believe that that little white figure was, was a human being on the surface of the moon. So um, I just realised that must be the most exciting job in the world. And so I then focused on how do I get there? So I did engineering at Sydney University, science, 
and uh, wrote away to a company in, in Europe to say, look, I'll, I'll work for you for nothing, <laughs> which I did. Um, and then it just took off. And so once I got over there, they could see that I was very keen. Um, I was very lucky and, and I had 10 spacecraft and I've been working in Europe for the last 29 years. But you've now finished there. You've essentially retired from the, from the ESA. You're back in Australia. What opportunities are there here for you? Well, it's very frustrating for me to see that um, Australia once had a very deep involvement in the space industry from 1964 to 72, 10 100-tonne rockets by, built by the European Launch Development Organisation, which is now ESA, were launched from Woomera. And we had an enormous involvement in those very early years, but since then, effectively, nothing has happened. Uh, we've got uh, incredibly good engineers in this country that can do exactly the work that I've been doing, except I had to go overseas. And I see now the government is very keen on innovation, and I can just see some incredible opportunities for Australia to become a cooperating state with ESA for $20 million a year, and we could actually do the same engineering that I'm talking to you about now. We've got fantastic facilities in Canberra. On the top of Mount Stromlo, this year, the Advanced Instrumentation Technology Centre, which has all the facilities ready to build spacecraft. None have been built in the last six years.